You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. It's time to see what's making the headlines with the incoming director of the Onward Think Tank, Sebastian Payne, and the editor-in-chief of the National World Cities newspaper group, Nancy Fielder. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. A recent wave of murders has prompted Rishi Sunak to pledge to make Britain's streets safer. That's according to The Express. The Times has word of a pledge from Labour that, if elected, tackling antisocial behaviour would be one of their major priorities. The Mail believes that the shelving of a Treasury re review into the country's tax systems is effectively an admission that the government no longer intends to cut taxes. According to The Guardian, families of dementia patients are voicing their concern after it emerged that more than half of residential homes inspected this year were rated inadequate. And the Financial Times reports that ExxonMobil is suing the European Union in an attempt to quash a windfall tax that would cost oil companies around £22 billion. A reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by Sebastian Payne and Nancy Fielder. Welcome to you both. Let us start with the Express and this vow by the Prime Minister to uh, tackle crime, um, committed to making the streets and homes safe for everybody. And this is after a horrific wave of murders over Christmas, which we've been re reporting on. Sebastian. Yes, there's not a huge amount to this story that every prime minister you could imagine over the past couple of decades has said they want to make the streets safer and they're going to try and clamp down on some of the most egregious and most awful crimes like those being reported on the front page of the Express. But as with all these things, the question is, how is it going to be done? Where is the money to do this? What are the process to see this through within the Home Office? Now, Rishi Sunak has made crime a pretty big part, I would say, of his agenda for being prime minister. Uh, I recall when I went to the G20 summit with the prime minister for the end Bali, he did a huddle with journalists on the plane. They talked about this on the plane and Mr Sunak gave a very tough line on crime. It harked back to what Michael Howard said in 1995 when he said prison works and it feels as if that's an approach he wants to get to. There's not a huge amount new in this express announcement here, but I think the rise in particularly violent crimes is something that is going to be a big problem for the Prime Minister in 2023. It's something that Conservatives are going to have to turn around if they've got any hope whatsoever of winning the next general election. So it's fine to say they're going to bring it down, but they actually say how they're going to go about doing it. Yes, the, the question how is, is a big one. But, but Nancy, can we assume from the Prime Minister saying that he will ensure police have the resources to tackle the criminals that uh, a lot of money is going to be thrown at this? Well, I suspect that is how they're going to try and tackle it, or that's certainly what they're going to hope the headlines will say. But as we know, the number of police officers on our streets has fallen consecutively under every single government and so we're where we are, partly because of political decisions. Now, they've had recent big recruitment campaigns, but it hasn't really scratched the surface. And also, fundamentally, it's okay. great to say you're going to punish people who are doing horrific crimes. And we've seen some absolutely devastating murders this Christmas. But they've also taken away youth services. They've taken away mental health support in schools. They've taken away fundamental blocks which help people get to a life, which is what we would say down, is down the right path. So there's nothing there to actually turn it around so that future generations are anti-knife crime or don't want to carry guns. They're not really tackling these problems at the root and punishment isn't going to solve it for future generations, even if it makes it slightly better now. And to be honest, we've no evidence that it does. It doesn't seem to help at all. So they're going to have to do some really serious reinventing of their own policies if they really want to make a difference and change, change society. Meanwhile, the, the Times tells us that, that Labour is declaring itself the party of law and order, Sebastian. Yes, well, this is the flip side of this, that the perceived inaction by the government means that Labour think they can try and score some political runs on this. And Steve Reid, who is the Shadow Justice Secretary, has given an interview to the Times tomorrow where he wants to update Tony Blair's very famous slogan, which was tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, by instead saying it's going to focus on prevent crime, punish criminals, protect victims. And I think that, you know, 
on the one hand, you can see the obvious opening with the big reduction in community orders that have been put forward in the past decade and the statistics on the front page, the Times tomorrow, that says they've halved in the past decade. That's obviously a big problem for the government, something they're going to want to try and take advantage of from the Labour perspective. But with all these things for Labour, you know, it comes back to this question that, you know, Nancy was alluding to, which is, do you throw more money at the problem? Do you look at systemic reform? The Conservatives have tried to put 20,000 police officers back on the street, which in some respect is just putting back what was cut by Theresa May when she was Home Secretary in the austerity years. So we'll end this sort of 12, 14 year period exactly where we were in terms of the number of police officers. Um, I think it's completely fine to say being tough on crime, being tough on the causes of crime. No one, again, would dispute that. But the question is, why isn't there confidence in the criminal justice system? Where do police need the resources? They've got more on the ground bodies. That's clearly happening. The number of police officers have increased over the past couple of years. But are those resources within the right places? And of course, the big backlog we have in the court system plays into this as well, following the COVID pandemic. So there's no easy answers on this. But the fact that Labour's going so big and thinks it can make such political gain on an area that is obviously normally for the Conservative. So it's just what an opportunity they think this is to try and put some clear dividing lines between them and the government. Mm, some more of the detail. The uh, Shadow Justice Secretary, Steve Reid, saying that increasing and strengthening the use of community sentences uh, would tackle reoffending rates and give a voice directly to victims. Uh, victims will be able to select the unpaid work that offenders carried out. So victims will be seeing justice done. Nancy. Yeah, and that all sounds really good, doesn't it? I mean, it does irk me slightly when the focus is on what the slogan's going to be, because if you've just been burgled or if you're living next to jobs, you don't really care about slogans, do you? What you want is action, and that's what we haven't seen. Interesting, just in the last few months, most police forces have now said that they will attend all burglaries. I mean, it's mind-blowing to think that actually the vast majority of burglaries weren't attended. And if you think that antisocial behaviour can be tackled without huge investment and without huge policies to, to, to systematically change things, it's just not going to happen. But it's, it's, all, it's not just the big murders and the big headline grabbing one is it is antisocial behavior it's kids who are on the streets because there's nothing better for them to do there is so much that needs to change here and actually neither party is coming out with really substantial change and it's a lot about headline grabbing it's a lot about slogans and that's not going to make any difference and hope you would hope it wouldn't win them elections because people need to know the detail but community sentences are great i think we'd all like to see people punished and giving back to their communities when they've taken something from it in the first place. Yeah, another slogan just at the, the end of the piece here uh, from Labour. Prevent crime, punish criminals, protect victims. Let's take a look at The Guardian and the new TUC chief. Um, he, he's got some, some stark words for the Prime Minister, Sebastian. Yes, Paul Novak is taking over from um, Francis O'Grady, who's been head of the TUC for quite some time now, in an interview saying the Prime Minister needs an exit strategy from industrial disputes. Who knew that was the case? Um, I think everyone in politics can see they need a way out of that. But that's, of course, once again, something that's easier said than done. But Mr Novak is, is saying that he thinks the government have overestimated public um, um, sympathy with the government's position as opposed to strikers and saying this is not about a kind of 1980s playbook and has basically said that Rishi Sunak needs to try and settle them and in some respects that is obviously correct and I've We've just been some reports over the past 48 hours or so that uh, the RMT union are close to doing a deal with the government on the rail strikes that could be done by the end of January, which will come as a huge relief to many of uh, the commuters and holiday makers across the country. But still the most pressing one, I think, for me, the one that's most tricky where the government will need to compromise is the dispute with the nurses, that there's a huge amount of public sympathy for their plight. And obviously there was talk over the um, before Christmas about a one-off payment for the nurses, which ultimately didn't actually sort of go anywhere. But I think um, Mr Novak is, is right that obviously if the government doesn't find a way out of this, it will keep on rolling and rolling throughout January and there will be more strikes. And the question with public sympathy on this is always a tricky one because up until this Christmas period, people have been on the side with the strikers. They can see where inflation's at. They can see how under pressure public services have been. But on the other hand, if that disruption keeps on going, there's always 
always tends to be a tipping point, which is why I think it's so interesting. There's been these reports of the RMT getting into deal territory, as it's called, and trying to get this thing resolved. And I'm sure Mr Sunak wants to do that. But he's also been very clear he's not going to do double digit infla uh, inflation busting pay rise because that would prolong the economic issues facing the country at the moment. So an exit strategy won't include that. Yes, no, absolutely. An exit strategy is needed. And one might think that uh, the, the word that they need to, to look for is negotiation, but that's something that the government have not been of a mind to do up to this point, Nancy. It does seem fairly straightforward when you're not involved, doesn't it? If you don't talk, then how are you going to solve it? And this is a really bad look for a relatively new government. I mean, it harks back, doesn't it, to being so out of touch during COVID and partying while, while lockdown's happening, sticking your fingers in your ears and thinking that you don't have to treat people like human beings, you don't even have to listen, really, really isn't a good look. And I mean, the, the public is just so massively in support of the NHS workers, perhaps less so some of the other strikes, but everywhere you go, there does seem to be very vocal support for all of these strikes. And the more and more of them come, the more public support, because this is not a union strike. These are human beings who don't want to be on strike, who don't want to give up a portion of their already small salary because they feel they have to do this to get acknowledgement and reward from the government. So, But for to have a prime minister who is refusing to lead is a really, really bad look. And it, hopefully he's going to change his mind because I don't, there is no other exit strategy. So negotiation is the only way forward. Uh, very quickly, well, I would just say I think there has been plenty of negotiating going on here. First of all, the RMT have been in and out of the Department for Transport for a long period of time trying to get a deal, even though this is not their responsibility. You've got to remember there's the train operating companies who set the pay, and the government has got involved with that. Steve Barclay has had several rounds of talks with the Royal College of Nursing. So I don't think it's fair at all to say there have been no talks. Of course, but, but Steve, been Steve talks, Barclay wouldn't but... talk about pay, though, would he? He wouldn't talk about pay because, as you are well aware, it's set by the Independent Government Pay Commission that sets where salaries should be. The only place the government can intervene is looking at working conditions and the overall employment package. So I think it's not fair to the government just sitting back and letting this thing go by. They do want this resolved. I think ministers are doing that. But what they are okay. not willing to do is just to get big price to make it yeah. go away, which is what people... Like the head of the TUC has suggested. But, but it is factual to say that, that they will not discuss uh, pay, as you said, because of the independent uh, pay review body, that they're leaving that up to. Uh, we must leave it there for the moment. We're going to take a break, but do stay with us. Coming up, the Mail is worried about the Treasury shelving a review into the country's tax system. We'll discuss that and more next. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview. Still with me, Sebastian Payne and Nancy Fielder. Let us take a look at the FT. And this story on the front page is to do with uh, Italy and the United States imposing COVID restrictions on uh, Chinese travellers. Italy is to test all passengers arriving from China for coronavirus. And this is following the, the upsurge in uh, COVID-19 within China. Nancy. Yes. So, I mean, this follows changes in China to the rules um, for travel. It's been really, really strict for a long time, as we know. Um, it's been absolutely sort of zero tolerance of travel and that's changed. And so internationally, countries are reacting to this by bringing in their own measurements to stop people or to test people when they're traveling into other countries. Uh, people are incredibly worried about new variants, new waves of COVID that perhaps the vaccines aren't ready for. And so I think it was sort of, it was pretty automatic that people would react in this way once China did lift its travel restrictions. And here we are, I think we can only hope um, for the best really. It's been pretty tough in China, but the last thing we want is for it to be spread around the world again as we've all previously lived through the lockdowns, haven't we? Yeah, and we read that Japan and India have also imposed new requirements for Chinese arrivals, Sebastian. 
That's right. And I think America's announced just um, since these papers went to press, they're going to require a negative COVID test before anyone from China is allowed to enter. And I think obviously this is a result of China's ridiculous zero COVID policies, where they've essentially tried to clamp down and lock down any small outbreak whatsoever of COVID over the past couple of years, long after every other country has moved away in terms of those sorts of restrictions. Um, but, you know, it is an inevitable consequence of that. And China's faced a huge amount of protests that um, of people have been fed up with this. They had to move on from zero COVID. But as it reintegrates itself to the rest of the world, both in travel, trains, economy, that's going to have big impacts. So while there's the health issue here, if the Chinese economy is properly starting up again, that does risk a whole wave of inflation hitting the hitting elsewhere. Because so far, a lot of its economic growth has been quite dampened because everything's been closed up and locked down. But I think, as Nancy said, everyone will just be hoping that it's not too restrictive and people are still allowed to get about their lives and that the pressures of COVID on the Chinese health system aren't too great. Yes, it does have a knock-on effect, doesn't it, for the rest of the world. In Germany, there are demands that flights are suspended um, until they're sure that there's no threat of a new dangerous mutation out of China. And that is the worry that there, there could be some further mutation that, that we're not resistant to, Nancy. That's right. And we all know that there was sort of accusations of responding too slowly originally when sort of COVID, when most of us had not heard of it. And yet we went on for it to completely turn all our lives upside down. So it is good that they're reacting this way. We've got to react fairly, but we have got to react swiftly. Um, and I think countries, that, as you said, there's already sort of half a dozen countries reacting to it, but there will be more. Um, and I suspect we'll see sort of every country in the world responding in a bit to keep it under control because we all know how horrific it can be. Sebastian, to the mail, um, we read of um, plans to shelve at the Treasury review, that the one that was promised under Kwesi Kwarteng, that the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has seemed to have um, quietly swept under the carpet, according to the mail. Yeah, I have to confess, as someone who spent the past four years writing about various tax reviews and the like, I wasn't actually even aware this one existed, but here we are. So <laughs> it turns out when Kwasi Kwarteng was Chancellor, he commissioned this review into Britain's tax efficiency, and it would not take a genius to work out that our tax base should probably be a bit lower than it is at the moment, given that the tax burden is at a seven-decade high. But this review has been uh, scrapped by Jeremy Hunt, the current Chancellor. It won't be used to inform the budget in March. And this will have political knock-on effects because many on the right of the Conservative Party, those who want to see taxes lower, will see this as further evidence that the Sunak government is not in favour of cutting taxes because obviously the burden has risen significantly in the autumn statement we saw a couple of weeks ago following that disastrous mini-budget. And John Redward, the veteran um, tax-cutting Eurosceptic, is moaning on the front page saying it would be it should be an integral part of any future budget. But it feels as if that that's not where the government's priorities are right now. And I think that's probably right, that people aren't desperate for tax cuts at this moment. What they want is financial stability. That's what we saw in the autumn statement. And the moment for tax cuts will probably come at a later date when inflation is lower, interest rates are coming down, and the economy is in a better place. But again, this is definitely a political headache for the Sunak government.